Welcome to The World Below, The War in the Heavens, a podcast exploring the adventure, the intrigue, and the magic of a land that lies beneath the celestial battle between gods and demons, a clash that has gone on since time immemorial. I'm your guide, your interlocutor, and your host, Michael Pryor. Welcome, everyone, to episode 39 of the World Below the War in the Heavens podcast, the ninth episode of season four. This one is a geographic episode, and it's all about Vesbesali, the vast tropical island to the north of the main continent in the world below the War in the Heavens. The Overview A few basic facts first. Vesbesali is nearly 3,000 kilometres long from northwest to southeast, and about 800 kilometres wide at its widest point north to south. An enormous mountain range runs practically the length of this immense island, dividing it into two parts, north and south roughly. It has an extraordinary variety of landscapes and what you might call ecosystems because the mountain range includes many staggeringly tall mountains which harbour large glaciers and the ridges and flanks of the mountains can cut valleys off from each other. Much of Vesbesli is covered with wet rainforest but there are vast swathes of savannah, dense mangrove systems, wetlands, lake and riverscapes, seagrasses and huge stretches of coral reefs. As if this diversity isn't enough, Vesbesali also has many active volcanoes and areas of intense volcanic activity. Earthquakes are commonplace throughout Vesbesali and tsunami aren't rare either. The weather too tends to extremes with monsoon floods a regular feature of the calendar and cyclones frequently batter much of the island. Vesbesali has a reputation for mystery and danger, but when you think about it, that's really a point of view statement. To the people from the continent, Vesbesali represents a lure or exotica and perhaps a chance of riches. To the people of Vesbesali, it's simply home. And when I say the people of Vesbesali, it's almost a glib statement but it contains multitudes, for Vesbesali, with its many different locales and environments, is home to an extraordinary range of people, many isolated from interaction with others because of the local geography. To lump them all under a heading of the people of Vesbesali is misleading at best and insulting at worst. So many different cultures and languages in this extraordinary place that it's no wonder that some of the most adventurous and open-minded people from the continent to the south journeyed to Vesbesali, curious about what it may hold. The stretch of ocean that separates Vesbesali from the continent, the Camptia Strait, is nearly 200 kilometres wide, but it's dotted with many islands within sight of each other, some of substantial size, So the crossing from Vesbesali to the northernmost part of the continent would have been an achievable venture, even in very ancient times. And indeed, evidence has been found in places like Framen, Brel and Benthia, realms in the far north of the continent, to suggest that trips across the Camptia Strait may have been quite commonplace in ancient times, with trade going in both directions to judge from the masses of pottery and the surviving metalwork. More recently, products such as timber, gems, some ores like copper and gold, as well as dyes that are hard to come by on the continent, flowed south from Vesbesali, while grain, coal, advanced metalwork such as arms and armour, and particularly glasswork, went in the other direction. In early historical days, something else that prompted the crossing in both directions was simple curiosity. The bold, the adventurous, the people who looked across the water and wondered what it was like on the other side often made the journey. Most disappeared into history, but a few made their mark either by staying and making a name for themselves or by returning with tales of their travels. For instance, in the 14th century, the lone adventurer Chariclo Sulla made the crossing and spent two years exploring Vesbesali, travelling along the entire coastline as well as braving the mountains, meeting people, trading, and she documented her adventures in 
My Time in Besbessily, which became a bestseller after she returned to Anarchist. It's interesting to compare Besbessily with Jalox, the large island to the south of the continent. Over the centuries, various communities in Besbessily had a reputation equally as fierce as those of the Jaloxians, producing warriors both brave and skilled, much in demand as mercenaries or simply as recruits valued for their courage and expertise, particularly with ranged weapons like bows. Both islands host extreme environments, and perhaps this sort of thing breeds hardy warriors. With such a range of environments, it's obvious that Fezbesley has an extraordinary range of animal life and plant life. Vegetation ranges from the abundant wet rainforests right through to scrubby, hardy alpine plants. It also has extensive grasslands that are lush and quick-growing. As for animal life, as on the continent, Reptiles have populated nearly every ecological niche and only the loftiest mountains are free from their presence. It's a matter of some pride among the people on Vesbesily that they have such a variety of venomous snakes, many of which are lethal in the extreme. For instance, the blue striker is a common 15-foot-long whip-like snake that is particularly feared because it isn't only extremely fast, moving through even tangled vegetation as if it wasn't there, it is notoriously bad-tempered. While many Vesbesily snakes avoid people and other large animals, the blue striker will go out of its way to attack, as if it resents anything trespassing on what it sees as its domain. In this wonderful world of nature, a fascinating event to witness, if you like this sort of thing, is the very small-scale battle that takes place in some of the mangrove areas of Vesbesily, where large metallic-coloured spiders the size of a dinner plate regularly go to war with tiny lightning-quick snakes that infest the roots of these salt-loving trees. These snakes are small, less than a foot long, but they work in concert, appearing in wriggling masses when the spiders dare trespass on their domain. The spiders don't take a backward step, though, because with all those legs it might be difficult. In any case, these spiders are particularly known for leaping, jumping easily a foot or two, and make a difficult foe for the snakes. The leaping, wriggling, darting struggle is said to be spellbinding, which is a problem because of the way crocodiles also love to inhabit the mangrove areas, and if you're watching the snake-spider battle too closely, you may not notice a hungry crocodile sneaking up on you. Be careful and watch your back at all times. Large constrictors are also very much at home on Vesbesily, climbing trees easily and fearing little. Falling asleep in the jungle at the base of a tree that is home to one of these immense and bulky snakes is a surefire way to stop being a jungle explorer and becoming dinner. Bird life abounds on Vesbesily, and while much of it is loud and colourful, parrots are numerous and striking, others adopt greens and browns and are difficult to see, especially in the dim light under the extensive jungle canopies. The large, flightless and aggressive birds of the continent have their cousins here, and they're larger, if anything. They stalk the rainforest with utmost stealth, death in the shadows. An encounter with any of these is to be avoided. Perhaps the most famous of the birds of Vesbesily are the birds of glory. Most of this extraordinary family of birds is about the size of a crow, but somewhere in their past it seemed as if they decided that simple flamboyance wasn't enough to attract a mate. This show must be taken to the next level. With dazzling colours using every available part of the rainbow as a beginning, birds of glory display magnificence in remarkable ways, using iridescence, reflection and the ability to actually emit light, having coloured patches that can blink on and off in patterns as complex as their song, and often in a sort of counterpoint. Wing shape, beak shape, extraordinary trailing feathers, every possible aspect of the bird of glory body and shape has been tweaked to dazzle. In ancient times it was assumed that these birds of glory actually came from the heavens, bringing tidings to the world below, for it was difficult to conceive that such astonishing creatures could be of this mundane world. 
Perhaps the most amazing of the birds of glory was the crowned hoverer. As the name suggests, it had a circlet of golden feathers around its head that looked like nothing as much as a regal crown. Its body was a lustrous shimmering silver and the tips of its wings blinked crimson on and off. Its behaviour was unique in that it could not only hover in place, when undertaking its courting dance it would spin around and around in the air in a sort of mini vortex, folding its wings and singing a song so lovely that brave people wept to hear it. All the while, blinking red spots left incarnadine trails like memories of fire. Sadly, the crowned hoverer was hunted to extinction. Elders in a village on the edge of its very restricted habitat prizing its trailing feathers for headdresses. At a festival with nearby villagers, when the leader of this village proudly displayed her headdress that she claimed came from the last of the crowned hoverers, she and her village were immediately shunned and all contact essentially cut off. The offending village disappeared from history. From that point on, one of the most strongly held traditions on Vesbesily was that the birds of glory were not to be harmed, but admired instead in their natural habitat. In the 10th century, a band of desperados from the continent crossed to Vesbesily with the sole aim of hunting birds of glory for their feathers. They had barely begun their brutal harvest when they were set upon by hundreds of villagers from across the district, acting in concert and even suspending a long-standing feud between two of the major families in the area in order to respond to this outsider threat. None of the foreign hunters survived. Cities there's Bessily in the modern day has many cities, but almost all of the largest are on the coast. Towns and settlements further inland are smaller, and communities in the mountains are smaller again. Over the centuries of contact with the continent, travellers from the south often arrived to find that what was once a bustling seaport or fishery had disappeared almost overnight, with the jungle quickly reclaiming buildings, roads and farms. The tropical environment hosts a number of virulent diseases, but the local inhabitants generally had a degree of tolerance. Not so the visitors from the south who either took precautions or suffered greatly. So disease isn't a convincing explanation for these sudden disappearances. Clashes between local communities over resources or simply personalities has been documented as a source of these wipeouts, but many simply appeared to be a case of the local inhabitants packing up and moving elsewhere for reasons that remain mysterious to visitors from the south, but eminently sensible to those who lived there. One of the largest cities was established on the south coast and remains there today, almost explicitly to make the most of the trade with the continent. And this was in what the Anaquistians would call the second century or thereabouts. Mashleave was established at the head of a large, almost circular bay at a point where the Tis River entered. The Tis was a large river that regularly channelled huge amounts of water from the mountains and the uplands out and into the bay. On the eastern arm of the bay, right on the shoreline, sat and smoked the significant volcano known locally as Eji. Mount Eiji was far from a dormant volcano and its constant rumblings and occasional ejection of smoke, steam and rocks make for a lively display. And at night, runnels of lava coursing down the side of the almost conical mountain can be seen from many miles away. Magic in Vesbesali as for the rest of the world below the war in the heavens, magic has a long history in Vesbesily. Just like the continent, it has both suffered and benefited from heaven falls, the source of all magic. And just like the continent, magic began with curious and perhaps foolhardy individuals experimenting with heavenly stuff before gradually becoming a more systematic and rational pursuit. These early experimenters, or at least the ones who survived, often became renowned, personages of great power, prestige and influence, even if they were entirely legendary. 
Many stories exist handed down over the centuries of Allah the Wondrous, Pom of Klum, and the notorious Drachengor, who was reputed to have brought a number of villages together under his malevolent rule and to have turned day into night for them for years. The great advance that set Fed Specially on a magical course quite distinct from that on the continent occurred somewhere in the 1300s, when several magic practitioners independently hit upon the method of grinding heavenly scales to a powder, a notoriously difficult task given the nature of the heavenly material they're made of. And, in fact, the process remains a secret to this day. Once powdered, the results are combined in various proportions to create a range of extraordinary effects. In the 15th century, a further advance saw what the modern-day magical theorists call the Vizbesili method, where the carefully combined magical powder is mixed with purified oils to create a paste that is then used to paint with and the magical paintings themselves opened the way to a vast variety of miraculous magical effects. Whereas the usual magical practitioners on the continent are theorists and fabricators, with percipients sometimes included among their ranks, Vespesily has theorists, compounders and artists, with percipients being rare but still part of magical work there. Theorists are as for the continent, hypothesizing, investigating, analyzing and deriving magical methods through calculations. Compounders have the hands-on job of grinding the heavenly scales and then mixing the various colors to create the magical medium at the heart of Vesbesily magic. Many compounders are happy to actually mix the paints that artists, as you might guess, who have the innate talent for painting with the magical paint, use to create magical effects. These magical paintings are often done in situ on walls, rock faces and even, amazingly, on large stretches of sandy beach, with the most highly skilled artists astonishing effects have been achieved, portals that can be used to cross hundreds of miles in an instant, automatons that step out of the picture and become animated servants of incredible strength and endurance, or Landscapes and seascapes that are weather-taming, turning an approaching hurricane to something matching the calm scene depicted in the magical painting. The other main difference between magic in Vesbesily and on the continent, at least in the modern day, is that Vesbesily doesn't host magical schools or faculties or university departments, as is the case in places like Anarchist. Instead, perhaps following a traditional pattern, magical practitioners on Vesbesily come together in informal conclaves or shared interest groups as necessity arises. Often these are the result of a particularly knotty problem that theorists have come across and can't solve as individuals. The word goes out, a conclave is held and a meeting of minds occurs where, more often than not, the problem is solved. Magical practitioners on Vesbesily seem to be apart from or above the conflicts that are common in this rugged and sometimes dangerous world of isolation. The outcomes from these groups are held to be so useful to all those living on Vesbesily that the practitioners are allowed to cross territories that may be at war and they're guaranteed safe passage by all. In the modern day, magical practitioners from Vesbesily are often in demand on the continent and can command high fees because of their vastly different approach to magic, not to mention the vastly different effects they can create. Conversely, practitioners from the continent often cross to Vesbesily because of their own special skills. This international back and forth has been conducted in a spirit of mostly collegiality and goodwill, with much learning taking place on both sides. Mostly. Because of the often extremely rugged landscape, heaven falls on Vesbesily have sometimes been difficult to locate and claim. Some are simply inaccessible. And this has led to a specialty of the coastal people of Vesbesily, and that's the underwater reclamation of heaven falls, something that's very difficult on the continent to the south. And this is probably because much of the coastal water of Vesbesily is extremely clear, 
where one can see the sea bottom through hundreds of feet of water, and this has facilitated the development of a range of skills needed for underwater retrieval. A specialty worker has arisen to meet this need of claiming marine heavenfalls around Vesbesily. These young people, and they are almost always young people, can dive to immense depths while holding their breath for minutes at a time. When a heavenfall is discovered, dozens of these divers plunge from barges and attach cables to whatever object has been found. Without them, clumsy grappling hooks need to be used which run the danger of damaging the precious treasure. Naturally, such a trade is dangerous and not just the obvious dangers of drowning. Like the northern coast of the continent, the coast of Vesbesily and its islands are host to many savage marine species. Large predatory fish like sharks are ubiquitous, but the divers don't consider them a substantial problem. They fear the marine reptiles far more. For instance, crocodiles grow to an immense size in this part of the world, and they cruise the waters constantly looking for prey. But they aren't the only dangerous marine reptiles. The carnivorous bronze turtle is almost invulnerable because of its shell and grows to 20 feet or more long and it's notoriously cranky. It thinks nothing of snacking on a diver or two when in the mood. Then there are the legends or rumours that speak of even larger creatures that populate the depths, cold-blooded marine beasts with long snaking necks or, or jaws that can swallow a killer crocodile whole. Stories tell of canoes disappearing down the throat of these formidable monsters and many in the modern day insist that such giants are quite likely to exist but even the advocates for such horrors poo-poo the stories of shipwrecked mariners hauling themselves onto a small island that turns out to be a dozing behemoth that soon submerges, drowning all the unlucky sailors. Princess Imla In the 1500s, in Anaquis during the reign of King Mormigan III, a small delegation arrived in the capital from Vesbesily. Princess Imla of the far northwestern city of Histria had brought her entourage to Anaquist because, as she put it, Anaquist was widely renowned as the richest, most powerful realm in the entire world below the war in the heavens, and she needed to see it for herself. Having entered the city so graciously, she was welcomed warmly and granted an immediate royal audience. Here, she revealed that one of her other reasons for coming to Anaquist was to establish the veracity of a legend that had long been held to be true in her hometown, that Histria was founded by traders and adventurers from Anaquist itself. She modestly pointed out that, if true, this meant that King Mormigan and she could be related, if distantly, which greatly pleased the king, taken as he was with this intriguing stranger. By all accounts, Princess Imla was extremely charming, and she entertained all with her tales of life in Vesbesily, the extraordinary animals and birds, the interesting ways of the people, and the eye-opening magical practices there. Scholars from the Hypogeum were very impressed with her knowledge, and traders confirmed that her understanding of that far-off land could only have come from someone born and raised there. Tall and immaculately presented, she carried herself with what all who saw described her as regal bearing. Her accent was likewise described as enchanting, and after the royal audience the king insisted that Princess Imla and her entourage were to be accommodated in one of the finest houses in Anaquist, the Cake Lodge. The Cake Lodge was a whimsical mansion which had been built on the orders of King Mormigan's grandfather and named because it looked like the airiest construction of a master baker, with delicate balconies, filigree buttresses and slender towers at the end of each wing. The Cake Lodge was surrounded by a large, splendidly landscaped estate and it was a jewel of anarchist much admired until it burnt down in 1666. At the king's suggestion, Princess Imla and he spent some weeks in archives throughout the palace, the hypogeum and the library of souls. As well, she conducted her own tours throughout Anaquist's finest buildings. In between showing the princess through the palace and the treasury, 
Always seeking to impress the delightful young, perhaps, cousin, the king directed hordes of scholars to assist in Princess Imla's researches. In her time in Aniquis, the princess was always accompanied by a pair of twins, solemn-faced attendants who never spoke and who wore splendidly patterned baggy trousers tied at the ankle with vibrant red and blue ribbons. These distinctive garments immediately sparked a fashion craze in Aniquist, and young men competed to waddle along in the most voluminous and brightly coloured pantaloons. A month after Princess Imla arrived, the king ordered that a state banquet be held and immediately followed by a royal ball. Instantly, all the well-to-do, and those who wished to be well-to-do, scrambled for invitations. Princess Imla and her attendants were whisked here and there, hosted by the would-be banquet-goers desperate to get the nod. She visited museums and galleries, trading house floors and military messes, country estates and flagships, and was fated wherever she went. Pamphlets and broadsheets of all kinds competed to bring news of the princess's doings to the world. Potteries worked day and night to meet the call for plates featuring her likeness, as well as mugs, snuff boxes, and chamber pots. Roving musicians strove to write songs that did the princess justice, and on many a street corner could be heard choruses that tried to outdo each other with praise for the captivating visitor. In short, it was Imla mania all over Anaquist. So when, a mere six weeks after she had first entered Anaquist, Princess Imla and her delegation disappeared, it was uproar across the realm. The king summoned the palace guard and demanded that they find her. The army sent out patrols to the outskirts of the city. Commoners took it upon themselves to search, calling out, looking in cellars and barns to see if she had been abducted and imprisoned. Everyone was sure that she had been the victim of a dastardly plot. Several of the king's advisers counselled that a delegation should be sent to Histria immediately in order to convince the Vesbesely people that the princess's disappearance had nothing to do with Anaquist. It was around this time that some of the household staff of the palace began to report missing objects, valuable trinkets and items once displayed around the palace. It took a while for these reports to filter upwards, but eventually the royal chamberlain began to investigate, and when he was confronted by the large, empty frame that had once been filled with an old and extremely valuable portrait of Yukantha Anaquist, well, even he began to get suspicious. The murmurings grew when one by one households that had hosted a visit by Princess Imla and her entourage confessed that they, too, were missing valuables. Of course, some of the oldest and most famous families didn't report anything, but most people put that down to embarrassment rather than those houses having superior household security. Perplexed, the king agreed to his advisers and sent a delegation to Vesbesely only for them to return some months later, abjectly apologising as they'd been unable to find any trace of a city called Histria. In fact, in their efforts to find this rich and prosperous city, they began asking around about Princess Imla, only to be met with gales of laughter wherever they went. In essence, anyone they asked about the princess replied, don't bother trying to find her. She's not there. It took them some time to meet someone who took pity on them and revealed, in a regional mountain dialect, Imla meant one who dupes fools. More investigations, more tallies, and it became clear that the princess and her attendants had been happily ransacking everywhere they went, eventually making off with a small fortune. If they couldn't pilfer valuables unseen, they were quite happy to do it almost in the open by way of filling the padded and voluminous trousers the attendants wore. The king, rather than be outraged, was delighted and roared with laughter when the details of the brazen fraud came to light. His amusement was echoed right across Anaquist. Such audacity, such confidence, such impudence appealed to Anaquistians high and low, and it wasn't long before stage plays about Princess Imla were being rolled out across the capital, followed by volume after volume of cheap books extolling The Further Adventures of Princess Imla. No trace was ever found of the mock princess, although rumours abounded for some years, mostly about how her ill but cleverly gotten loot had set her up for life. (music) 
Last words. Besbesely is a land of extremes, which is a bit of a cliché, but in this case it's accurate. Even in the modern day, much of it is still opaque to those on the continent. It has immense appeal for those of an adventurous cast of mind, and fortunes have been made by those who are willing to make the crossing. That's all for episode 9 of season 4. Next episode, another folktale from the world below the war in the heavens. This has been The World Below the War in the Heavens, a podcast exploring the history, culture and esoterica of the world below, a continent of magic and mystery with inhabitants who keep one eye on the sky at all times. I've been your host, Michael Pryor. If you'd like to find out more about me and my books, pop over to www.michaelpryor.com.au. Farewell.